Hello, everybody, and welcome to Max Basement Brewery. Today, we're continuing our tour of the world's greatest breweries. And this week, we're here in fabulous Framingham at John Harvard's Brew House. We're going to take a tour of the operation they have here and see what they have to offer. Let's go down and talk to Brian Sanford, the brewer, and see what he can show us at the brewery. Let's do it. Well, Brian, thanks for having us here at uh, John, John Harvard's. Harvard's. And uh, we'd like to really see the brewery. Why don't you tell me a little bit first about how you got started in brewing here at the brewery? Uh, completely by accident. I uh, was between jobs and uh, took a job in a brew pub in the restaurant. Decided I was really uh, into the beer, wanted to brew. And uh, the brewmaster, that brew pub left to become the brewmaster at John Harvard's and was nice enough to give me uh, an assistant job, uh, an apprentice basically, and kind of worked my way up from Based that. Based on all of your training with on the other side of the beer Exactly. Bottle. College, <laughs> uh, even back in the high school days. Yeah. Uh, great. Plenty yeah. of beer, so. Well, that's great. That's the way we like to uh, <laughs> fall into a new career. Exactly. Well, Brian, why don't we uh, take a look at the brewery all right, come and see on what in. you have. Brian, what's this? Dave, don't throw that out. Mm. Starting up the old mill there, I Dave. didn't destroy anything, did I? Absolutely not. All right. Uh, basically, this is our uh, two-roll mill. We take the, uh, the malt over here. Uh, it comes in 55-pound bags. And the first step of the process is we want to crack it open. And what you just turned on was the mill that does that. And the mill, as you can see, is attached to an auger which will convey the grain, once it's milled, up into the mash tun. And uh, approximately how long does it take to crush, for instance, 100 pounds of grain? Um, for a full-size brew for us, which is about 600 pounds, it takes about a half an hour. High-capacity mill. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Very efficient. And is it adjustable? Is the crush adjustable? Yeah, you can adjust both the uh, consistency of the grind and how fast you want the grain to go through the mill. Basically, the the log jam would be the auger. You can mill it faster than you can convey it. So there's a little chute over here on the side, and that's how you control the speed of the grain, how fast it enters the mill. I see. Now, how much uh, grain do you normally grind in a week? Uh, we usually brew four times a week, so uh, probably just about a, a ton a week. Ton, 2,400 yeah, pounds, somewhere 2, in there. 2,000 pounds a week or so. Uh, perhaps some of the people who watch our program would like to know uh, why it is uh, you know you crush the grain. Can't you just take the grain and uh, dump it right into your mash tun? And well, actually, what you're trying to do is you want to uh, expose the starch on the inside of the grain um, to the hot water, and that's going to activate the enzymes, which are going to break the starch in the grain down into sugar. So if you just dumped it in, obviously none of the starch would be exposed to the water. So it does need to be cracked open. Here we have uh, some Pilsner malt, which is a German, very light grain. Um, we use English grains and some German grains. Um, you know, we do a wide variety of styles, colors. This would be the lightest grain that we would use here at the brewery. Um, and we go all the way up to uh, roasted barley, which mm -hmm. is uh, black. Um, and we use that in the stout, you know. Is that anything like the so-called black patent malt? It's uh, basically the same malt. It's just not uh, malted. It's actually just roasted like hot. I see. So this is what they mean by clean in place. I stayed a little too long and they put me to work. Where's that map? You should be sharing some of my burden with me. Hey, Dave, what are you doing up there? Oh, Brian, this is uh, kind of a tight quarters here. A little snug up front. A little snug, but uh, why don't we see what uh, we have going on here. And uh, Dave, you can, uh, you can just keep working, you know. Earn the beer for us. <laughs> Well, Brian, uh, now that we got rid of Dave, why don't we uh, show me how the, uh, the flow of the product works here. You already did the uh, milling right. back in the malt mill room. And then what happens here? Then uh, we have the milled grain being dumped into this vessel on the left, uh, which is called the mash tun. This is the mash tun. That's actually two vessels. So we have the hot liquor tank on the bottom and the mash tun on the top. Oh, OK, so you just heat all your hot water down here. Correct. And then pump it up and back into the grain right. to set up your mash. I see. Um, okay. Then the runoff port for the, uh, the mash tun runs just straight across into this vessel, which is the kettle. Okay. Dave was uh, scrubbing away for us. He cleaned that up real nicely nice. for us. Nice and shiny on the inside now. 
Now, when you're in the mesh, just to step back, do you have to stir that, or do you have any uh, automatic stirring? Or uh, no, we have the uh, the manual stir, the mash agitator up yeah. there on the platform. Oh, let me check that out real quick. Oh, this is a very high tech. Very high tech. Yes. We've seen some other ones, but uh, this looks uh, a lot like the one I have, but I have the old-fashioned wooden, wooden one. agitators. We went I the see. great expense of stainless. I see, and then this isn't really very deep. That's touching the bottom right there, right. so you can really stir things up pretty well. Yeah, you can only reach, it's long enough to reach all the way to the back, too. So. Oh, I see. That's great. Okay, so now we've mashed, and you're going to pump it over here to Dave's super clean kettle. Um, and then how long do you boil for? We do an hour boil. An hour boil? Um, for us, full kettle is uh, 14 barrels. 14 barrels. 434 gallons. Wow. And, uh, That's what I need. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so you boil for an hour. And yeah, and then the beauty of this uh, equipment um, is that everything is hard piped together with all the valves. So we can pump the liquid from each tank without having to uh, hook up any hoses. Oh, um, OK. So what we do is we take our, our hot wort. Here's our uh, plate heat exchanger. Your chiller. A chiller. We'd, okay. we'd pump yep. it through here um, into one of the fermenters. Add our yeast, and we're ready to go. OK, that looks pretty, pretty simple. Yeah. This looks a lot like the brewery at my house, too. <laughs> the only difference, really, is that mine has signs on it that tells you which is the mash time, uh, which is the kettle. We didn't go for the and, signs. Yeah, that's, well, that's important, yep. so you remember. Okay, well, it's got a nice, we don't have much room here, as we can tell, it is pretty tight, right. but it looks like you've got things configured so that a nice uh, tight area, it works well for you. We have a nice layout, everything, uh, although you said it's snug, everything's laid out really nicely, easy Great. to work with. It, well, it looks like it. Why don't we uh, follow the beer, for the fermenters. follow the wort over to the fermenters, and see how you do that. All right. These are our uh, primary fermentation tanks. Actually, they're uh, dual purpose. They can either be a primary or a secondary. Um, okay. Here at John Harvard's, we do uh, a two-stage fermentation. So we do the uh, initial fermentation. As you can see, this one's uh, fermenting nice and vigorously. Boy, that thing's really bubbling. That looks just like a blow-off tube that we use when we're home brewing. Like same principle, same exact thing. Do you um, get any uh, material blow-off here, or just gas? Just gas. Just gas? Yeah. OK. Um, for us, the typical fermentation lasts uh, three to five days. And okay. uh, once it's done, uh, we cool the beer down and we'll transfer it to uh, another tank that just happens to be empty. Um, the yeast okay. will settle to the bottom. Okay. And we can collect the yeast and reuse it. Okay. How much do uh, these tanks hold? These are also 14 barrel tanks. Okay, so you could do a whole gas. batch yep. from the boiler and the mash right into a, a primary fermenter? Exactly. Okay. And what kind of beer do you have going in here now? This is a uh, pale ale, our this best seller. Yeah. And okay. uh, next door we have some uh, imperial stout. And I think in this tank we have some uh, porter. Okay. Now one important thing that uh, it, with any any beer making is sampling, of course. Absolutely. You have to measure the gravity and uh, do some flavor evaluation yeah. kinds of things. Now can you do those off of these tanks? Every one of these tanks is fitted with a, what's called a swickle. Or a, a sample port. A swickle, not a, swickle. A, not a swiggle. Nope. <laughs> it's not for swigging. And just for you, we, uh, we brought out the giant uh, sampling cup. Ah, this is the, brewer's, the brewer's sampler. Exactly. Huh? Oh, now this, this is my kind of sampler. Let's, uh, you said this was the Imperial, Imperial Stout. Stout. That's a nice light beer, nice right? Nice and light. Nice and light beer. we make. Why don't we try this and see. Uh, oh, yeah, look at that. I suppose if you fill the whole thing, it's a little hard to handle. You don't That's, want to spill any. Don't want to spill this. No, you don't want to waste it. Liquid huh? gold. <laughs> yeah. So this is how you would normally do your, your flavor evaluation and test tasting. Exactly. Oh, yeah, Brian, that is, that is sweet. That's nice. Just transferred today, nice and fresh. That is. That's a great beer. Now, you would ordinarily also use this for uh, this super ladle for your yeast collection? Correct. Is that right? We have a nice uh, uh, layer of yeast on the bottom of the tank. And with the ladle, it's nice and easy to collect. And then we'll just reuse it the next time we brew it. You just scoop that out and put it into a, a five-gallon keg? Yep, Is that yeast keg. All right. Usually give it 24 hours to recuperate. And then we'll uh, pitch it into uh, the next brew. Ready to go again. Yep. 
Okay, so now you said three to five days in your primary fermenter. Correct. And then uh, you pump it to yep. the secondary. And how long would you put it in your secondary? Depends on the beer, but usually a week to 10 days. Um, we did a double block recently that we, uh, we lagered for five weeks. Oh, so okay. It depends on the beer. Um, so you're looking at roughly a two week? Most beers, two week cycle, start to finish. And then you're ready to, ready start, to start selling. Move it on to the next step, give it a quick filtration, and uh, pump it to the bar. Okay, and that all takes place in the uh, keg box, which you can't Back see. Back in it's your right keg box. This way, right through, if we could walk through the wall, we could get there. Uh, I'm assuming you have a door. We have a door. So why don't we uh, go take a <laughs> look right. at that? <laughs> well, here we are in the uh, cold room. We've left Mac back out there sampling the Imperial Stout. And uh, this appears to be the nerve center of the, uh, of the distribution part of the brewery. This is all the uh, finished product that's uh, served at the bar right in this room. Everything is kept here? Yep. I know there's some kegs here. Do you actually do a lot of kegging? Or? No, we just do a very little kegging just for our own use. Um, when a tank gets low enough uh, that we can fit the beer into kegs, we'll take the, uh, the beer out, put it in kegs, go back, clean and fill the tank, and that way we kept the brand on. We didn't run out. Rob, what's the ambient temperature in here? It's, uh, it's a nice uh, 38 degrees. And this, it looks like an accordion on steroids. Uh, exactly. This is how we make the beer nice and uh, crystal clear. It's uh, a plate and frame filter press. And uh, basically the way it works is we have uh, something called DE, diatomaceous earth, mm -hmm. in these uh, sheets. And the beer would get uh, pumped in, literally get pushed through the sheet and across the sheet. Um, and this filter press is set up so that we actually have two stages. We have a rough filtration in the front and a uh, polished filtration in the back. So the front will get the big stuff out, the back will finish off the little stuff, and the beer would come out the side nice and crystal clear. We pulled out all the yeast, all the uh, proteins that would cause haze. Do you serve any beers at all that are not uh, filtered? Sure. Um, any of the wheat beers we do, we do a Belgian white in the summer uh, that's unfiltered. Um, all the fruit beers that we make are all unfiltered. And uh, cast conditioned beers. Cast or? conditioned beers would be naturally filtered. Uh, we have some Isinglass that we mix up and uh, finings. Yep. Now, I notice on a lot of these vessels, in fact, on all of them, I see a label that says tax determination. Uh, yes, correct. What is that all about, Brian? Well, these tanks all have a, uh, a sight glass, which tells us how much beer is in them. Uh -huh. Once the beer hits this stage, it's taxable by both the federal government and the state of uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, and so we would pay tax based on how much finished product we get into this tank. I see. To, this, to the federal government, we pay $7 a barrel, and to the state, we pay $3.30 a barrel. All right, the state of Massachusetts yeah. taking less money than the federal yeah. government. How can that be? I know, that's true. <laughs> um, and these tanks are, uh, we have a little uh, a special device here. This is called a proof coil, or a pigtail. And, and what it does is it lets you take a carbonated sample that's under pressure out of the tank without getting just a big glass of foam. Uh -huh. uh, and as you can see, it works rather nicely. And this particular beer is? This would be a Scottish Ale. Nice, dark, malty, sweet beer. Mm. Great stuff, great stuff. Yeah. Uh, Brian, I cannot help but notice the heavenly and unmistakable aroma of hops. Yeah, this is uh, the, uh, the room where we store all our hops. We use uh, both pellets and whole hops for uh, dry hopping. And here we have some nice uh, whole Chinooks. And uh, we usually have three or four different uh, whole varieties and four or five different varieties of pellets, depending on the style of beer and how uh, how hoppy we want to make it. We have um, American hops, German hops, English hops, a uh, little bit of everything. I see, and uh, is there any advantage to using uh, pellets over the whole hops or vice versa? Yeah, we would only use pellets in the uh, in the kettle. Otherwise, if you use whole hops, you gotta get them out of the right. beer somehow. So it's easier to, uh, to deal with pellets in the boil. Absolutely, and then to get the, uh, we find the whole hops to be a little more aromatic, so when we dry hop, we like to uh, use like a cheesecloth bag put that in with the, uh, the conditioning beer, get a nice floral hop aroma. And what is this Rube Goldberg like uh, <laughs> assemblage on the wall? These are, these are called manifolds. And what these will do is uh, the beer will leave the serving tank 
and then at the bar we have two sets of faucets. And so the, this is the line from the serving tank, and then it splits to each line, each tower at the bar. And these big pipes are coming, uh, these, this is just insulation, isn't it? Yeah, this would be uh, a beer line chiller, so that the beer is wrapped in a, uh, a glycol chilled line so that it won't get warm on its way to the bar. Great, you thought of everything. Absolutely. You thought of everything. Well, Brian, this looks like the end of the beer line here. This is it. This is it, huh? How about a little flavor evaluation to uh, wrap up the show here? The end of one line and the beginning of another. What do you got pouring here for us, we Brian? We some of our gold. This is the gold. I'll try the gold. We got some pale. The pale. Nice Going with that nice right amber. Our best seller. And we'll do a little stout. All right, we've got the full color spectrum here of beers. Covering the beer color spectrum, yes. Common sewers of fine beer. <laughs> Must be a nice stout with a slow pour like that. Yeah. And that one's set up for food. a second. Nice cascade. All right. Oh, that's beautiful. Beautiful stout. The perfect pint. Say. Well, Dave, we made it through another show. Bailey. Bailey. Brian. Brian, thanks for your hospitality. Thank you for you here. And thanks to John Harvards for having us. Well, Dave, wouldn't be a show without answering our viewers' questions. So, uh, what do you have for us from the mailbag this week? There was something interesting here sent to us by uh, Joey in Chelmsford. And he says, My lag time after pitching. Uh, and airlock activity always seems to exceed 24 hours. It's sometimes as much as 36 hours. I pitch a half a quart of active starter after aerating well. I know I've aerated well because after the fermentation starts, it always uh, finishes at the expected final gravity. Should I make a larger starter? Uh, do you have any other suggestions? Well, Joey, a uh, long lag time, which is the time from when we pitch the yeast, until fermentation, active fermentation starts is important. We like to keep that down to much less than 24 hours. And you could pitch a larger starter. Uh, a half a quart or a half a gallon is probably about right for a five gallon batch. But what I've found is if you oxygenate with pure oxygen instead of uh, aerating by shaking the carboy, you end up with a lot faster uh, start to your fermentation and I'll show you how I do it uh, at Max Basement Brewery. What I use is a carbonating stone like this. This is a Gulf Stream carbonating stone. It's stainless steel uh, with very small holes in it. I connect it to a, a, a tank of oxygen and you just open the valve with this down in the bottom. Let it go for about 15, 30 seconds maybe at the most and you'll get just about the right oxygen level. There's a great article in the uh, September 96 Brewing Techniques magazine that talks all about how to get the best amount of oxygen into your homebrew. Now, another interesting thing, Dave, about using the carbonating stone, they do call it a carbonating stone for a reason. I use this same stone on uh, this fitting. This is a uh, five gallon uh, Cornelius keg lid with a, a gas tap attached to it. That tap comes off to a hose and I connect the aerating stone, the carbonating stone to this hose. This drops right down into my keg and I can carbonate a batch of beer in about a half an hour, which makes it just right for a quick tasting. So this is a pretty handy gadget to have around. How do you know when uh, you've carbonated enough if you're carbonating uh, you know, that quickly in a Cornelius keg? Well, Dave, the way I do it, you can follow the uh, charts. You can uh, calculate it. The best way, I think, is still to sample it. Of course. Take a taste. Course. If it's carbonated, you'll know it. Well, Dave, I guess that's it for uh, this show. We had a great time. And until we meet again, happy brewing.
I'm Dennis Sellers, the Ashland Fire Department, and today I'd like to go over extinguishers, their types, use, maintenance, and installation. What we have in front of me today are some of the industrial type applications that we have for extinguishers that are out there today. Um, we're dealing with classifications in class A, B, C, D, and halon type extinguishers. The class A in this case will be a two and a half gallon pressurized water extinguisher. The gauge to make sure that the system is charged, two and a half gallons of water with strictly compressed air. Used on anything combustible, uh, basic combustibles around the home that you might find in your wastebasket. Um, some wooden furniture. That's what this would be used for. The next would be a dry chemical extinguisher also powered by an inert gas um, that is what we call BC. B being flammable liquids, C being electrical or energized equipment. People get very confused with the electrical equipment being that just because it's a typewriter, it must be electrical. Well, obviously it is, but once the power has been cut off to anything such as that, it's no longer electrical fire. It's strictly a combustible fire. You could fight it with either the, the the B, C, or the A, because it may just be simple enough to put out with that. We have next a halon extinguisher, which is used in electrical applications, such as computers, switching areas, you might find them in telephone companies, or where there's a lot of money tied up in heavy duty electrical equipment. We have, again, a B, C type extinguisher being the CO2 type extinguisher. It can put out a lot of fire, but it leaves some residue Depending on the situation you want, you may need one. And last but not least, we have a Class D extinguisher, which will put out metals that will burn at very high temperatures. And this is about the only thing that you'd ever want to use this for. If you have any situations in your home where you'd want one, don't hesitate to buy one. It could be very, very handy because of the situation that it can cause. Very briefly, very briefly now, I'd just like to say that we have Two other topics that I'll cover later um, that I just want to make you aware of. We have what we call the fight or flight system and the pass system. The fight or flight is basically what it says. Can you do it or should you get out? The pass system is nothing more than what after we discuss everything here will we'll make you, it'll be an acronym for how you use the extinguisher. I'll cover that a little later in the show. To get started, like I say, we, we've gone over the types of extinguishers, um, all powered either compressed air or inert gas. Okay, before covering the installation of the extinguishers, I'd like to stop and say that once you've bought an extinguisher, the first thing you want to do when you get it home before you do anything else with it is to take the extinguisher, sit down, read the label, read the information about the extinguisher. It's not going to do you any good if you're standing there with an extinguisher in your hand the stove is on fire, that is not the time to read the extinguisher. The time is to have it in a quiet moment when you're not under any kind of a pressure, where nothing is in danger of happening to the house. Make sure you read the information, read the literature. To install an extinguisher isn't that hard, but putting it where it'll do you the most good at the right time is what it's all about. You want to have that extinguisher 
in a situation where after you get done using it, if you have to use it, you can escape. You want to put it by a door. You want to put it by a door that you can have a quick egress out of. You don't want to, you don't want to put it by a garage door that may take time to go up. You want to have it by a door that you have easy access to and easy flight. Because once you, once you start using it, like I said, the in the fight or flight system, you want to make sure that you can get out. Installing, ex installing extinguishers are no more difficult than finding the right location. Calling the fire department and asking is also something that you could, you could do. But putting them in a situation where you're not going to get burned, where you have a free escape route. Those are your biggest things that you won't have to worry about. Before the situation arises, before you want to have to do the fight or flight, what you want to take into consideration is using the 911 system. It's available in Ashland. Don't hesitate to use it because we will be there shortly after the call is made. It's important to know your children, everybody in the home, anybody in the office should know the 911 system is available. It goes to the police. It goes to the fire department. So we all know what's happening. So don't hesitate to use it in a situation. Call us first. If you can't put that fire out, then we want to know about it. We want to know that what, what is happening is the safety in mind for you and your home or your business. Once a year, everybody is supposed to check their smoke detectors in their house, in their apartment, in their buildings. Check your batteries. You can add these also to your list of things to do with your, with your smoke detectors is once a year, take the extinguisher out of the bracket, check the gauges, check the hose, make sure that the operating pressure is still there because it would be nothing worse than an attempt to fight a fire, get burned because the extinguisher was not ready to use. So once a year, make sure when you check your batteries and your smoke detectors, you check your extinguishers as well. The next point that I've touched briefly on before is the fight or flight system. The fight or flight system in that you've made your call to the fire department. You've gotten your extinguisher from an area that's safe to reach initially. What you want to do now is, if you can't reach that and put that flame out, whatever the situation, whichever extinguisher you have, if you can't put that situation out within three seconds, then you don't want to make any more of an attempt. You want to make sure you've called us. Make sure that you're heading out of the building. Make sure your family is out. Make sure your coworkers are out. The fight or flight, you have to make the decision. It's very difficult for somebody that's never been in that position to take the fight or flight, use the acronym, fight or flight. If you can't get it within three seconds in your first approach, then make your escape out of the building. The PASS system that we have is another acronym to remember, because what you want to do is grab your extinguisher. If there's a situation with a pin, you want to pull your pin. You want to aim your extinguisher. You want to squeeze the handle, and you want to sweep at the base of the flames. Going over the top is not any good. Going over to the side or bouncing it off a wall is not any good. You don't want to spread the flames. If it's a, it's a flammable liquid situation, it doesn't take much to spread those flames worse than they already are. You always want to stay at the base of the flames so that the, the fire is covered gently and put out. Use the pass system. Pull the pin, aim, squeeze the handle, and sweep at the base of the fire. 